Hey guys, welcome back to the channel, Flight Attendant Lifestyle. If you guys are new here, hello, welcome. I'm Stella, a Washington DC based flight attendant. I travel the world and I take you with me here on my YouTube channel. Last week, I didn't have any flight attendant trips, any flight attendant vlogs, any fun flight attendant TikToks because I didn't work any trips last week. So that's like a really cool thing about being a flight attendant is you can really manipulate your schedule to really fit your lifestyle and your personal schedule away from work. Bart, my husband was out of town and I don't typically like to pick up trips or work trips when he's out of town because then I have to find a dog sitter for my dog. So all of that gave me the idea for this week's video, which, which, which is basically just answering some of your most frequently asked comments that I just constantly see in the comment section. I recently started a TikTok page and, or a TikTok channel. Is it a page? Is it a channel? Is it a... I, I don't, I don't, I don't even know. What, what is the TikTok called? So these are really just some of the questions and comments that I like just continually see all the time. So a comment that I just always see across all different social media platforms is what do I do with my dog? What do I do with Francis when I go and work flight attendant trips? And most of the time, it's not a problem. Most of the time, Bart is home, my husband's home, and even if I go on a trip, we'll have a dog walker come during the day and walk Francis, and then obviously Bart will walk him at night and watch him throughout the night. But when he's out of town and I have a flight attendant trip, I used to always have a dog walker and slash dog sitter, and she was amazing. I like loved her, she's still my friend to this day, but sadly she's still in New York City. I do have like a really good dog walking service here in DC, but I haven't quite found a really good dog sitter, uh, or I just haven't like been able to trust anybody with my dog uh, just quite yet here in DC. So if Bart is out of town and I do have an overnight trip, I will just give that trip away. I most likely will not work it or I'll trade the trip for turns. So if I have a two day or a three day trip, I'll put it on our trade board and just say, hey, I've got a two day trip. Does anybody have a turn or two turns that they'd like to trade for? And most of the time I can trade the trip or I can just drop it all together and then plot other trips on my schedule that will get me back that day so I don't have to overnight anywhere. I always just get so many questions on Francis, like is it hard to have a dog when you're a flight attendant? I would definitely say yes. If you don't have help or when you don't have somebody that can watch your dog, it is a very difficult to go on overnight, three day, two day trips, four day trips, and not have somebody reliable to watch your dog. So it's really hard if you don't have somebody uh, but it's doable, it's definitely doable. You just have to find good babysitters. <laughs> lots and lots of questions on Francis, Franny, Bubbers, Boops. He's got so many little nicknames. Um, also, a lot of people always refer to him as her. Like, oh, she's so cute, oh, what a cutie she is. I'm like, it's a he, Francis is a he. I know he has one of those names that could go like either way, but I should start putting his like pronouns at the bottom, he, him. His next comment that I always get asked, again, across every single social media platform, and the question that I get asked in my DMs so much is, how do I become a flight attendant? What do I need to do to become a flight attendant? And I would say my best advice to anybody who wants to be a flight attendant, maybe you're in high school, maybe you're in college, and you're thinking, I really wanna be a flight attendant. I wanna travel the world, I wanna see everything, and I wanna be a flight attendant. I would say start getting customer service experience. Get a job at Starbucks, get a job at Nordstrom's, get a job at Disney. What is another, get a job at Apple. Starbucks, Nordstrom's, Disney, and Apple are four of the best companies with the best customer service skills for their workers. <laughs> During our initial flight attendant training, I know those four companies were mentioned because their customer service was so amazing. Our company was like, 
let's strive to be like them. Let's strive to be like Apple, to be like Disney and give that amazing customer service. I feel like that's going to put you ahead of somebody who might have all the schooling and everything else, but no actual customer service experience. That's going to put you to the top. You're going to float right up there. Also, I always say if you want to be a flight attendant, you really need to show that excitement during your interview process. Any interview that you have, whether it's on the phone, video or in person interview, you should be smiling like till your face hurts. Like even if you're on the phone, like you the whole time you're talking, you should be like, yes, yes, I'm so excited about that. Let me tell you about this experience. Let me explain to you this. Yeah, that was a bad experience, but let me tell you about it. Never leaving that smile from your face. People can feel that smile. They can hear that smile. No matter where you are in the interview process, that smile is the one thing that should go everywhere with you and your excitement. So customer service experience, a huge smile plastered across your face and your genuine excitement for the job are definitely three things that will help you prepare to be a flight attendant or get you the job when you are doing the interview process. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, my butt's getting sore on these counter stools. I don't normally film here, but I thought, you know what? I'm gonna sit at my little counter here, my bar area, and I'm gonna film here. But like these chairs, they're not that comfortable. I think my shorts were like hitting them wrong. <laughs> okay. All right, next question. Oh, okay, next question that I get asked a ton is does age matter? Does height matter? Does weight matter? Does wearing glasses or not having glasses or even I have braces, does that matter? I would definitely say for any of the airlines in the United States, I don't think any of that matters. There were people in my training class who were in their 50s and there were people who were in their 20s and like everybody in between. So I don't think age matters. With height, the same thing. There were really tall people in our class and there were really short people. There were people with glasses, there were people without glasses. Some people had braces. I know for me, my first year as a flight attendant, I got Invisalign and I had Invisalign in. So really none of these fact, none of these age, height, weight, uh, glasses, no glasses, none of those things really factor into you getting the job or if you can apply for the job or if you can do the job. If you want to be a flight attendant, but you think you're too short, you might weigh too much or too little, or you might be too tall or you have glasses like me, <laughs> like you can totally still apply. Like don't let anything hold you back. If you want something, you're never going to get it if you don't at least try or if you don't ask. So definitely try, definitely go for it. Like the worst that can happen is you hear a no and you try again. And if you hear another no, you keep trying until you hear a yes, until you get the answer that you want to hear. <laughs> All right, next is something that I always, always, always get asked is what are the worst things about being a flight attendant? What are some of the cons? Why shouldn't I be a flight attendant? Convince me, Stella. I'm like, you should, it's amazing. I feel like with any job, there's good and there's bad. There's, I don't know of any job on this planet that is perfect. Like even me being a flight attendant, I love it so much, but there are times when I am like, I'm exhausted or I'm tired or I had a bad experience on the plane and I just want to go home and like hug my dog for 10 hours. Not every day is perfect and there are some cons about the job. Um, let, let's see. Okay, I will give you my top three cons of being a flight attendant and these are 100% you guys. These are really the worst things about being a flight attendant. Number one is your schedule. The first few years when you become a flight attendant, you will literally have the worst schedule ever. I am telling you, if you think like, oh, maybe I won't have a bad schedule, maybe it'll be okay. No, 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 no. You will have a really bad schedule at least the first six months, most likely the first year and possibly into your second and third year. So the way the flight attendant schedule is based on is seniority. So if you've been at the company 
as a flight attendant for 10, 20, 30 years, you're gonna get the first pick of all the trips. And most likely you're gonna pick the international trips where it's one leg, you get to Milan, you have a 48 hour layover, you get to London, you get a 24 hour layover, and then you fly and then you work one flight back. If you're junior and you've only been with the company zero years or one year or even two, any trips that all of those super senior people don't want is what you're gonna get to choose from. And those trips are more gonna look like 5 a.m. sign in, four legs, three hour sits in between each leg. You get to your final destination at like midnight and you've worked all day. And then, hey, guess what? Eight hours behind the door. So you have sign in the next day at 8 a.m. and you work another like 15 hour day. My camera stopped recording. I saw this sign flash like, camera has stopped because memory card has run out. Basically, when you first start out as a flight attendant, you have zero seniority. You have nobody under you to take the trips that you don't want. So that's why your schedule is not that great because you basically get everything that the senior people don't want. As you get over that and you start building more seniority, your trips will get better, you'll be able to trade them, your schedule will be a lot more flexible. I'm a little bit over six years and I pretty much can manipulate and change my schedule to get the days off that I want. I don't, I, I can't always get like the best, funnest trips, but I can definitely get my schedule to be where I want it. Okay, so con number one is your schedule. Con number two is the pay. You do not make a lot of money as a flight attendant. I'm just gonna put it out there. I think my first year as a flight attendant, I for the whole year, working like a full schedule, I made about $25,000. 20 to $25,000, I don't exactly remember the exact amount, but that was me working a lot. I mean, every once in a while, yes, I called in sick when I didn't feel well, but I pretty much worked my full schedule because I wasn't married yet. I was living at the crash pad. I was in New York. Like, it, you know, you, you guys were there when I first started out as a flight attendant. I was like, fine, crew scheduling, call me. Let me go to wherever I don't mind. The pay scale is different for every airline. If you fly regional, I believe the pay schedule or the pay scale is a little bit lower than if you start off at mainline. Mainline, mainline, the pay is a little bit more. And then if you work at like Emirates or one of those really big international Singapore Air, like I don't know the pay scale over there for the flight attendants, but I know in the United States, I don't think any airline uh, starts off more than like $30 an hour. And that might sound like, ooh, $30, like that's really good. But you're only getting paid when the front boarding door is closed. You could be gone on like a three day trip, but you're really only getting 15 hours of pay because you maybe you get five hours each day. And like at a normal job, if you worked three days, you would get eight hours each day. And so that would be what, 24 hours? But because you're on flight attendant schedule, you're only getting paid for 15, but you've been gone and worked three days. It's definitely a different lifestyle. It takes a little bit of time getting used to. But the good thing is every single year you do get a raise, like no matter what, it's not performance based. It's not how many customers wrote it and said you were amazing. It's just every year, you're at year one is at this pay, year two is this, year three is this pay, and so on. And I will say at like five years, you get a really good pay raise. Well, at least with my company, after five years, you really start seeing a difference on your paycheck and you're like, I am rich, I am literally rich. <laughs> and then number three con for me, top three cons about being a flight attendant is jet lag. It is so hard to deal with jet lag. There is no magical pill, there's no magical method. I have flown so many international trips and the best thing that I find is that whenever I get to an international international destination, I just take a nap. I need to take at least a two to three hour nap. That recharges me, gets me set on kind of their schedule. If I get into, let's say London, I used to do JFK to London all the time. I'd get in maybe at seven or eight in the morning. I'd take a two to three hour nap and then I'd be up around lunchtime. I'd go get some food, do some sightseeing, maybe do some shopping and then try to get back in bed in time to get myself up and ready for pickup the next day. You're tired, you're groggly, like jet lag is real. And then when you get back into the States, 
it takes you a minute to like get your body readjusted to being back onto your time zone. For me, anytime I had international trips, I would never back-to-back -back bid for trips. So if I got back from an international trip, I'd make sure that I had at least a full day off to recover and rest and recuperate before I got right back out there. Jet lag, pain not so great, and schedule. Those are the three biggest cons of being a flight attendant. Next, I am a nervous flyer. Do you have any tips for me? Well, I will let you guys in on a not so secret. I am scared of heights, like 100%. I do not like roller coasters. I do not like high bridges. I will not go bungee jumping or sky diving. I don't even really like to look out the window when we're in flight. I mean, I will if it's really pretty, like, okay, it's gorgeous, I like it, but it's not really my favorite thing to do. But I'm still a flight attendant. I have flown hundreds and hundreds of flights even being scared of heights. I like, if I can do it, like you guys can do it too. But if you are a nervous flyer, I would definitely say when you are booking your ticket, I would try to book a seat on the aisle. If you book a seat by the window, you're gonna be looking out the window. It might scare you, it might freak you out a little bit. I definitely wouldn't recommend sitting on a window seat. I also wouldn't recommend sitting in the middle because you're gonna have somebody on both sides of you and I feel like you can feel a little bit trapped and if you're already a nervous flyer, then you're gonna feel like you're gonna to add to that nervousness of being like trapped in between two people and like you can't look this way. If you look this way, it's weird. So you're gonna be like looking straight and you're just gonna be, it's just not good. So I definitely recommend getting an aisle seat. Also recommend that when you board the plane and get onto the plane, talk to the flight attendants, let one of us know like, hey, I'm a little bit nervous, this is my first flight, or I'm just not a good flyer, can you come check on me? Would it be okay if, you know, as long as the seatbelt sign isn't on, I can get up and talk to you mid-flight if I'm not feeling well? If you communicate with us and let us know, we are gonna do everything we can to like help you relax and help you not be so nervous. And also if you are a nervous flyer, make sure you have a lot of things to occupy you on the plane. If you get on the plane and you don't have any movies downloaded, you don't have your headphones, you don't have a book, you don't have a puzzle, you don't have anything to do, you're just gonna focus on how scared you are. It'll take your mind off the fact that you're on the plane, you're flying, you're nervous, and you're not quite like feeling that great. So. Lots of stuff to do, talk to the flight attendants, book an aisle seat, and even when you're booking the aisle seat, you can even like book towards the back because the flight attendants are typically in the back in the galley, always there talking, so it's easy for you to get up and just go talk to us as long as the fasten seatbelt sign isn't on. <laughs> and last comment that I'm always seeing, some, something along these lines is, what is your favorite place to travel to? And this is such a hard, Thing, hard question to answer. And I feel like people are always asking me, like even when I meet people, like, oh, what's your favorite place you've been to? What's your favorite place to travel to? I always think, well, gosh, I've been so many places and I appreciate every place differently. You know, I appreciate when I go to Egypt and see the pyramids. I appreciate when I go to Barcelona and go to the Picasso Museum, or when I go to London and I get to go to Harrods and go shopping at Harrods and Waitrose and get my favorite tea. Like there's so many places that I love for different reasons and I appreciate for different things. So it's always really hard for me to answer that question. I guess though, I guess a place that I feel like I can go back to over and over and over again and I never get tired of would definitely be Italy. I love pizza, so when I go to Italy, I have like pizza every single day. I love the gelato there. I love all the museums and the culture. I recently, well not recently, a few years ago, I got to go to Tuscany and stay at a villa. Like. Oh my God, like mind blown. I just never ever thought I'd get to do something like that. And it was so much fun. It was like a week of doing nothing and just eating pizza, pasta, drinking wine, and just looking out at this like beautiful villa and vineyard. And I vlogged the whole time there, you guys, I did. I went in October and I was in the middle of me doing Vlogtober that year. And I was literally at the villa the whole time in October and so I vlogged it. So I'll link that below if you guys wanna see cause it was truly amazing. I might even go back and like watch those videos cause it was just such a good time. But 
I really do appreciate every place that I am fortunate enough to go visit, but I guess if I had to pick, oh gosh, what, like <laughs> this little gingerbread cookie cutter just fell. I guess if I had to uh, choose a place, it would definitely be Italy. Was that not just so weird that this like gingerbread cookie cutter fell? Like this is reminding me of something that just happened the other day. So um, I will end the video here and say bye. Thank you so much for watching. Be nice to your flight attendant. See you later. If you want to hear something that just happened to me, I'm going to tell you. I'm just going to tell you right now. So you guys know that that ghost encounter, that crazy like thing happened to me a few weeks ago or, or maybe even last month at one of my layovers in Los Angeles. I had a really crazy encounter with, I swear, a ghost or a spirit. Anyways, I did a whole video on that for you guys. So nothing weird has happened since then. I haven't been visited. There hasn't been like any spirits come like out or anything. But I will tell you guys, not last night, but maybe the night before or the night before. It happened within the last three or two days. I was dead asleep and I think it was right before sunrise because when I did eventually wake up, it wasn't pitch black outside. It was like the sun was about to come up. It was about to be what dawn and I was dead asleep and Bart wasn't here. It was just me and Francis and it, I heard knocking all of a sudden dead asleep. I heard knocking. It wasn't, it wasn't light knocking. Like, dude, like it was like, oh, I probably shouldn't do that on my iPhone, but it was like, like, and not banging, not like banging, but it was a hard knock. And I immediately in bed, like, like, you know, I, I just was propelled out of bed and I took a gasp. And within like a split second, I thought, who's knocking? It's the middle of the night. Like, is somebody trying to break in? Is somebody going to kidnap me? Like, what is going on? I have an alarm system. Like if they were knocking on a window, the alarm would go off. They must be at the front door because the alarm won't go off if somebody's knocking at the front door. Like what is going on? And that all happened in like one second, like not even one second, probably half of one second. And then I got up and as I got up out of my bed, I looked at the couch because my my door was open and I kind of looked out of my bedroom and I saw Francis, my dog, and he was sleeping on the couch randomly in that, in like right in my line of sight and he was dead asleep. He was passed out. So then it took me just another millisecond to realize that nobody was knocking because if somebody was actually knocking at the front door, Francis would have like gotten up and gone crazy and started barking and been like, what is going on mom? So I knew it was a dream. I knew it was something like that happened in my dream, but it was just that. I don't remember anything else from the dream except a knocking that like that propelled me and woke me up right out of bed. Like, I'm like, okay, I'm like so heated right now. I'm getting like so hot just talking about it because it's like getting me like all excited. I, like, what does that mean? to be woken up from a dead sleep with knocking. Like I, I immediately that morning I started thinking that morning, I felt like I started thinking of like, okay, I had a really crazy, like spiritual ghost encounter at the hotel. I thought it was just like a one-time thing. I've never ever in my life ever had anything weird like that. And then all of a sudden, Less than a month later, I have this knocking thing, like somebody is trying to get my attention or be let in or pass a message to me. I, I, I like, I don't really know. I know that um, something I didn't tell you guys that happened last year, whew, it's hard to talk about, but my grandma passed last year and but I don't, but like, I didn't think it was my grandma at the hotel because it, I, I was like scared. And I thought my grandma wouldn't try to like scare me. But then like, was my grandma like knocking on my DC home door? Did she want to say like, hey, Mijita, I'm here, hello. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. So this is so crazy. You guys like Stella, the ghost hunter, the ghost encounter, ghost whisperer coming at you. 
I, I don't know what all of this means. This is so crazy to me. And so many of you guys commented on that video with your crazy ghost stories. And I read so many of those comments and I got chills, you guys. So many times I got chills just being like, whoa, whoa. Like, so I don't know, what do you guys think? Are you still here? Is this video at like 40 minutes and I've just been talking? <laughs> like I need some water, my like throat is thirsty. Um, this is just so crazy to me, you guys, so crazy. And this little gingerbread man, was not like I swear he was right here on a surface like this like how did he just fall over it's almost like did somebody want me to tell you the knocking story <laughs> what? I, don't, I don't know I don't know okay but this is really goodbye for now guys <laughs>